Watch debut films from choreographers Jack Ferver and Omari Wiles as part of All Arts Dance Film Festival, Past, Present, Future, streaming free on the All Arts app and at allarts.org slash past, present, future. Hi, dance friends. I'm Margaret Fuhrer, editor and producer of the Dance Edit newsletter and podcast, here with another interview episode for you all. Our guest this week is Melissa M. Young of Dallas Black Dance Theater. Melissa is a DBDT lifer. She's in her 29th year now at the company, where she was first a dancer and then over the years a rehearsal director, academy director, associate artistic director, interim artistic director, and now artistic director, a post she's held since September 2018. She has really invested her entire being in the company's mission-driven work. Since Ann Williams founded DBDT back in 1976, the company has celebrated Black history and culture through the lens of dance. Melissa has continued and expanded upon that legacy, and she's also the type of leader the dance world needs more of, in that she's not an authoritarian, but a collaborator. As you'll hear her say, she wants to lead from the middle rather than the top. Here she is. Hi, Melissa. It is so great to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for coming on. I am giddy and filled with delight to be speaking with you today. So thank you for having me. Dallas Black Dance Theater is doing a ton of excellent work. So we have a lot to talk about today. But if you're willing, I'd actually like to start with a bit of your own story, because I don't think enough people know it. Um, You've been with the company for 29 years, both as a dancer and as a leader. So can you talk about your path to DBDT and about how your relationship with this organization has developed over the years? So I was uh, born and raised in uh, California. Um, And like many stories, I feel like sometimes certain parts of one's journey sound like someone else's story. But I saw Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater perform and it was the first time I had seen dancers who look like me on stage and um, they were doing Tally Beatty stack up. And that moment, it left an indelible impression. And I turned to my ballet teacher and I was like, do they get paid to do this? And she laughed. She said, well, of course they do. And I'm like, really? I'm like, I want to do that. And she said, if that's what you want to do, I'll help you get there. So fast forward. Um, <laughs> I think it's funny when you really think about the people who have crossed your path. So Donald McHale was on the board of the ballet school and Mr. McHale, he was my first modern teacher. Um, and then after that, I auditioned for the Ailey school. And uh, my sneaking suspicion is perhaps Mr. McHale put in a good word for me uh, to Miss Denise Jefferson. I don't know, <laughs> but um, I had never really been around so many dancers of color, um, learning different dance styles, Similar to my journey at Dallas Light Dance Theater, um, I feel like my journey at Ely was all encompassing everything because I did every program. I did summer program. I was a certificate program graduate. I was a fellowship student. And I was also one of five students who was selected to do an exchange program in Amsterdam. Um, And then once that program finished is when I came back to New York and auditioned for Dallas Light Dance. I didn't know anything about the company. And um, I took this, it was a crumpled up audition notice on the call board. This is at the old Ailey building, uh, 211 West 61st Street. Who can ever forget it? Um, And I went to uh, Mrs. Forsyth, Anna Marie Forsyth. And I said, hey, Miss Forsyth, who is is Dallas Light Dance Theater? Like, what is that about? And she took the paper from me and she stretched her arms out and was like, Oh, Ann Williams, she's the founder and artistic director. It's an amazing company. I think you should go. And so she goes, oh, I'll call her on the phone. And I was like, no, 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 you don't have to call. Next thing you know, she's on the phone with her. And she's like, oh, Ann, I've got a great dancer to send to you to the audition. I think you'll love her. I auditioned and moved to Dallas. I thought it was extremely strange. It certainly wasn't Southern California and not like New York. Of course, I was excited. I mean, I realized I was doing everything I had trained for, everything I wanted. 
And then at one point I started to think, am I in the right place? You know, all of my other dancer friends, they would stay at a company for two years or three years and leave. And then I felt like, is that the pattern? Are you supposed to leave? Are you supposed to go somewhere else? I didn't know. And so I started giving myself what I think are odd goals. I would say things like, I'm not going to leave Dallas Black Dance Theater until we work with Donald Byrne. Oh, okay, we did. Um, Alonzo King. Okay, that happened. I'm not leaving until they kept saying we were going to perform at the Kennedy Center. I don't believe them. I'm going to wait and stay and see. Kennedy Center happened. Lincoln Center happened. And then I really started getting ridiculous. I'm not going to leave until we go to Africa. And then we went to Zimbabwe um, and South Africa. And I was like, okay, Melissa, why are you playing games with yourself? Clearly this is working out. Dallas Play Dance Theater is providing the most extraordinary opportunities. And you might as well just keep on keeping on until you feel like you don't have anywhere else to go and grow. And so fast forward 29 years later, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> and um, after my 11th season, uh, it sounds like first world problems. I went to Miss Williams' office and I'm like, I'm kind of tired. I want to take a break. And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, can I just take a year off? And she said, well, if you take a year off, you know, I can't hold your position as a dancer. And respectfully, one can understand that. I said, okay. But I said, I don't want to leave though. I want to do something else. And she said, there aren't a lot of branches on the tree, but what about rehearsal director? And I was like, what about it? I was like, um, I've never done that before. This was her advice. She pointed her finger and said, Something tells me you'll figure it out. I was like, wait, what? And so I was nervous. Uh, I felt it seemed like I was dancing with my colleagues on Friday. And then on Monday, I'm telling them what to do. It was a struggle that first year because I felt like, did I make a mistake? Should I have kept dancing? You know, some choreographers were coming in that were on my bucket list. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm on the wrong side of the Marley. But when I kind of built a bridge and got over myself, I felt like, okay, I do have knowledge and institutional information to share. Um, and it made me feel good to, you know, help dancers grow. So, you know, I never went back to performing in my 11 seasons, um, you know, on the Marley. I felt like that was enough. I, I knew I didn't want to dance until I couldn't dance anymore. I felt like there was more within me. So here I am. Uh, at the end of year five of artistic director. Um, and it's a little overwhelming to think within these five years, most of it has been the pandemic life. Um, so mm -hmm. I feel now <laughs> my journey at DBDT, I can get through anything. If I, I think I feel unstoppable, um, I'm not perfect. Um, I've always you know, been good with being under pressure and rising to the occasion of various challenges. So I'm just taking things bit by bit and seeing how far it takes me. My next question, I, I feel almost a little crazy asking it because it's a question you've spent a career answering. So acknowledging that that's the case. <laughs> how, how would you describe the mission of Dallas Black Dance Theater? What makes the company unique and uniquely valuable in the sort of dance ecosystem? Well, our mission is to create and produce contemporary modern dance at its highest level of artistic excellence um, by bridging gaps uh, through cultures and diverse programming and reaching communities. But I feel like our mission and the elements of it you know, ex when I look at old videos, you know, from the 80s, um, you know, we were a young company then, but I can, I, you could see the consistency of, you know, Dallas Black Dance has always been trying to do its best, no matter what, with little resources, with more resources. And we've always been a diverse organization, you know, yes, Dallas Black Dance Theater, but there's always been, you know, a multicultural, you know, element to the body of dancers in the company within our staff. And then as it comes to programming, I mean, we are always trying to keep things interesting. I think just internally, not getting bored with feeling like we're offering the same type of work all the time. 
So I think the various choreographers we work with and the places we travel to um, and those communities we try to tap into, it's kind of like a, I don't want to say a potluck, but, you know, I, I think of like, <laughs> this amazing buffet there's a little bit of everything and all of the in elements as an individual piece you know are special but then you put it all together and it's something really powerful and genuine so I think you know the mission of who we are I think speaks through the art that's put on stage you know it seems like the rest of the dance world is sort of just now catching up to a lot of the inclusive ideals that have been part of, of your company's mission for years, for a long time. You've been quietly fighting for equity for years. So what can you talk about what that fight has involved? Wow. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I think, especially in these you know last four years, a lot of interviews I've done or conversations I've had with various people, you know, they said, you know, with all this diversity, equity, inclusion, what is Dallas by Dance Theater doing? What are you doing differently? And I say, we're not doing anything different. I'm like, we've always been diverse. We've always been inclusive. It's just been a continuum. So it's kind of a hard question for me to answer. Because it's woven into the fabric of, of, of who, who we are. are. Yeah. yeah. And I guess in, in some kind of way, I feel like we've been deepening who we are and really, I guess, unapologetically saying, this is Dallas Black Dance Theater. We're coming full force. We've always been here this way. But now with me trying to, you know, push the company forward, I'm here to push boundaries, always be respectful. But I want people to have an awakening of Black dance is everything. Black excellence, Black joy it's all the things that live within us. And it is unfortunate that, you know, we're always having to fight and prove who we are. And I feel emotional about it because oftentimes it's the scenario of feeling like always a bridesmaid, never the bride. It's mm -hmm. so many black dance companies, you know, we're fighting and it's evident that the work is strong, unique, powerful, inclusive, because it's not about proving who we are. That's what I love about Dallas Boy Dance. We're not here to um, showboat or put ourselves out like, hey, look at us. It's just a matter of like, this is who we are. This is what we're doing. Um, and it doesn't matter if we're at the Kennedy Center or at Johnson Elementary. We're still going to treat everyone the same and bring everyone into the fold because we know that what we're doing makes a difference. It makes people reflect on who they are. It makes them assess who they are as individuals within their own community. So the work is happening, but I just wish that the support of the dance community at large would be more active. Mm -hmm. It's about waiting for the rest of the world to catch up with you, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry to keep going in, in kind of a negative vein. We'll get back to the positive in a minute. But but in our email exchange before we talked, you mentioned that, and you've just said before, you're, you're always having to explain and defend the word black in your name. Why is that especially frustrating? It's interesting when you learn history that's not written or taught. So in our company was founded in 1976, and it was not until 1976 that a person of black or African descent in the state of Texas could start a nonprofit. And at that time, mm -hmm. the legal designation on any census um, that you would receive, that is what Black people were called, Black. You know, there's been African-American, there's been Afro-American, Negro as, you know, time goes back. So it's marking that place in time. It's the legal designation. And then my word, can you imagine not until 1976, can anyone of Black or Af African descent begin a nonprofit? So it's what Ann Williams wanted for the community, a place of comfort, uh, solace, peace for you know young Black children in the city of Dallas to train just like their counterparts. So you can't erase the history that brought us to this point. Yeah, the name is history. Yeah. 
it wouldn't be Mother's Day weekend without Alvin Ailey American Dance Theatre at NJ Pack. On Friday, May 12th and Sunday, May 14th, witness the New Jersey premiere of two new pieces, In a Sentimental Mood and Are You In Your Feelings? Saturday, May 13th, features a night of classic work choreographed by Alvin Ailey himself. And all three programs conclude with a rousing finale of the beloved favorite, Revelations. Get your tickets today at njpac.org or ticketmaster.com. That's N-J-P-A-C. So I want to talk more about you as a leader, um, because you mentioned that you like to lead from the middle, that your your leadership style is rooted in collaboration with the dancers. Um, why do you think that's important, especially in dance? And then what are the keys to doing that effectively? Because it can be really hard to get that right. <laughs> yeah, I, well, everything is trial and error, but I like to lead from the middle because I, I kind of look at myself, if you think of like, um, a wheel, like being the the center point and all the spokes branching out, that's everyone a part of our organization. So someone has to hold it together in the middle. And because I've blessedly been here for so long with the organization, I've been through just about every role. So I understand who we are. I understand the past and I understand where I feel we need to go. And the only way you can do that is to have open dialogue. Uh, I feel just based on my conversation with my colleagues who are, who are artistic directors um, and talking with other dancers, I feel like I'm different and I really push to be different. I listen and I hear what people are saying to me. As it relates to the dancers, sure, I could be, yes, I'm the artistic director. It's my responsibility and charge for the mission of the organization to maintain it, to push it forward. But no matter what I write down on paper, it doesn't matter if they're, if everyone doesn't have skin in the game. So it's simple things for me, like, you know, I ask the dancers, what choreographers do you want to work with? I can say, I can certainly be like, okay, here's the list of who we're working with. Um, I can even tell the choreographers, uh, cast this person, don't cast this person, but that doesn't feel right to me. So I literally asked the dancers, who are you interested in working with? Because I have dreams for myself. I have dreams for Dallas Light Dance Theater. And I have dreams for the dancers because it's our vision. It's our responsibility as a director to see what's inside of them that they can't see yet. But then they also have dreams for themselves. So if I'm unwilling to listen and implement what their goals and dreams are, then why am I doing what I'm doing? Because I'm not doing this for Melissa. Because every leader will know, would, well, most leaders would probably agree to say that, you know, leadership is a role of service and my vehicle of reaching people to bring out the best in them is through the vehicle of dance. So, you know, I'm, I'm in the airports and in the green rooms and, you know, when they're getting excited about certain choreographers or certain ballets in particular. And uh, in my office, I have this gigantic post-it on the wall with all mini post-its within it. So anytime I hear a conversation, I just write the person's name down, choreographer, and I may write at the bottom, um, dancer, so-and-so, you know, you know, this is what they want. And I just stick it on the wall. So that way I can look and refer to it. And anything that's good and meant to be can happen with a good plan. So I just start laying the tracks. What makes sense? Okay, what group of choreographers and works and so this has been my cycle um, for the last five years of how I bring everything together. And, you know, even working conditions, you know, as I said, in the humble beginnings of our organization, we didn't even have rehearsal schedules. We just showed up and was like, oh, what are we doing today? You know, so for everything from the business end of, you know, having that forward thinking plan, you know, what do the dancers need? What do you feel is lacking? What do you feel I'm doing that's effective as a leader? And what would you like me to implement more of? Um, or what do you feel is not working for you in terms of how I lead? Because I want people to be truthful and I'm here to grow. And I do the same thing with our administrative staff and our artistic staff. Um, I'm not going to be there like, okay, the season's going to be called this. And I want the images to look like this. 
everyone at Dallas White Dance Theater is an expert at what they do. So if we all can't bring our ideas together as a collective, then it's not going to work. You know, let's take this crazy journey together. I'm here to go one direction and that is up. Oh, and I love, I love that approach to leadership, that sort of collaborative approach, because especially in dance, because it feels like endemic to the creative process in dance as well. You know, like sometimes we think of the choreographer at the front of the room telling people what to do, the artistic director telling the company what to do, but you can't make dance by yourself. You need dancers. They are as much a part of that as anything else. And that's when people approach the leading of a company that way. I think beautiful things come out of that as, as you're seeing. Yeah. Um, so clearly you have deep respect for your dancers and you want their voices to be heard, not just on stage, but also behind the scenes. But you also mentioned that you are worried that some dancers today are viewing their roles in a way that's too transactional, maybe leading with, with money instead of artistry. And, um, that's actually a concern that I've heard from several other dance leaders that I've talked to. And I've also talked to some younger dancers about this. And their perspective is often, yes, dance is a calling for me, but the dance studio is also my workplace. And so I have to protect myself to a degree by thinking about it as a workplace. It seems like you have a really healthy perspective on this issue. Um, so what do you think the right balance is between, you know, dedicating yourself to this all consuming art and then protecting yourself as an employee. I mean, you've been on the dancer side of it too, so you've seen it from all angles. Yeah, I think it's a, it is an interesting topic because and concern should dancers be in a place that feels right for them artistically, emotionally, physically? Yes. Um, do they deserve to receive the most they can in terms of pay? Absolutely. You know, there aren't too many companies that have tens of million dollars budgets. So, you know, there's, you know, the having to compromise in certain situations, but no matter where a dancer is and no matter what their personal journey is, I feel like they also need to be accountable for their artistry. Are you chasing a paycheck or are you chasing your dance career and how you can get the most out of it? When you lead with that financial foot, it's a little off-putting. Sure, um, we can negotiate to make you know the transaction feel good for both parties. But when it comes to the artistry, what are you putting into it? Are you an artist who is truly investing your mind, body, and spirit into the work at hand? And it is an extraordinary sacrifice and emotional burden to decide each season am I going to do this again next year? You know, to wake up every day and put yourself through a full-time rigor. But when you've made the choice to do it, you have to be all in. So I, I think it's like this ball of yarn at times. And, you know, you and I both know these dancers work incredibly hard every single day. And I want the best for them. And I just, you know, getting that support at large, whether it's through grants and donors and individual giving. I mean, people come to the performances and you love it, but can you love it a little bit more and, you know, help every organization out in the best way possible? So that way the artists are protected and elevated as much as you applaud and standing, give them standing ovations. You know, we want that internally for them, but we can only do that again with that collaborative spirit. Yeah. The more support you get, the smaller that ball of yarn gets yes. and the easier it gets to unpick. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's talk about what's on the near horizon for you at DBDT, because you have your spring celebration program coming up next month. You have pieces by Chanel De Silva and Curvin Douthat Boyd and one of your own dancers, McKinley Willis. So tell me more about the program and about how you shaped it. Yeah, our spring celebration I think just traditionally has always felt like a celebration because it's the end of the, you know, performing season and we always want something, you know, for our audiences to look forward to and be uplifted by. Um, and yes, Kervin Douthat Boyd, he created a work 
uh, called Furtherance um, back in 2015, 16 season. And it's uh, a work that takes you from anguish to bliss. You just feel so uplifted and you feel hopeful. And Kervin is great. He's been a longtime friend of the company. And I just love what he's doing with his company, you know, over at Coca in St. Louis. So I, I just love supporting my colleagues in any way possible. And then our company dancer, McKinley, McKinley Willis, uh, she's a Dallas native. Um, and we are so proud of her. McKinley trained at Dallas Light Dance Academy. And uh, I was one of her first modern dance teachers. So I feel old when I think about knowing McKinley uh, under the age of 10. <laughs> Um, and now being in the company for, I think this is her eighth season. Uh, so it's a little bit wild, but this is her first work for the company. And I've been watching her grow as a choreographer. And that's one of the things I love, love, love about DBDT is, yes, as much as we want to hire choreographers from the outside, we've got some of the best creatives right in the room. So um, patterning after Miss Williams, our founder, I want to make sure I continue to give our dancers opportunities because, you know, why not elevate them if they're ready? But it also kind of shifts the leadership and dynamic of how, you know, their call, you know, their dance mates, as I call them, the other company members, you know, how they see her um, or each other. So her work is called Smile and it's about all of the facets of clowning. Clowns kind of terrify me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see the outcome, but I'm super excited. And the company members are having a great time as it's being sculpted. And Chanel De Silva, her work is called Tabernacle. Chanel should be the poster child of how a choreographer approaches an artistic director as it relates to the particular dance company trying to write grants to receive funding. Let me tell you. Uh, Chanel came to Dallas um, over a year ago, about a year and a half ago, and she came over. Um, I gave her a tour of our building. We had a great conversation. I felt like, wow, you know, I like her. There was no expectation, just getting to know you. Fast forward, a few, three, four months later, I get an email from her. And she says, Melissa, I know it's not customary for a choreographer to reach out to an artistic director, but ever since we spoke, I can't get it out of my head. There's this work that I would have been wanting to create. And if I would consider, you know, scheduling a meeting uh, so she can pitch her idea, Margaret, she had the working title, the number of dancers, the composer, she had a Spotify playlist. She had oh a Pinterest gosh. inspiration board with a costuming. I mean, I was so blown away and she gave her presentation and, in that moment, I thought to myself, I cannot end this Zoom call without telling her yes. So <laughs> I said, you know, I would love to invite you to create this work. So Tabernacle is coming from the perspective of Afrofuturism. Um, but really, she was moved by the whole George Floyd oh, phase and really realizing that, you know, the journey of a Black person in America <laughs> it's not an easy one, but she wanted to figure out how to tell the story, you know, from the woes to the glory. And I feel like this work truly speaks to that. We are delighted to uplift and amplify her work. It is stretching and broadening who we are as an organization. And I love seeing dancers in a room who love the work they're doing. Like, they are, <laughs> the way they're approaching her work, I know our audiences at Spring Celebration, they are going to be blown away. So I'm excited. Um, and I just want to keep, you know, giving people a glimpse of, you know, different facets of Dallas Black Dance Theater. So so actually, you sort of led nicely into my last question for you, which is kind of a zoomed out question. You talked, you mentioned before it that you have dreams for the company and your dancers have dreams. What is on the longer term horizon for you? What are those dreams and, and how are you moving toward them? Well, it's such an interesting question because uh, <laughs> I kind of uh, snicker and laugh a little bit because so often often I'm asked, um, you know, what's your vision for Dallas Black Dance Theater? Where are you taking it? What do you want to do? And 
I vary my response, but I think silently in my head, and I can't believe I'm saying this out loud now, but I usually say to myself, as if I were talking to the person out loud, you should wait and see, because that's how (laughs) it goes. But I want to continue this upward trajectory of where our company is going. I call it a pandemic positive. The pandemic truly has somehow uh, amplified our voice and our visibility, um, stretching across not just the nation, but the world. To think that our virtual programming, I think we reached 36 new countries, which is insane. So I'm really proud of that. Um, I really want to push the voice of the dancers. I think oftentimes audiences will say, oh, Dallas My Dance Theater or any other company. Oh, it said they're great dancers. What a good performance. I want people to get to know the artist individually. I want people to look at an image and go, that's Hannah, that's Sean. Mm. Um, I want them to really understand them as people. That's important to me. And I want to continue to surprise audiences with the repertoire we bring. I think a lot of times companies kind of stick with the same choreographers, you know, the same handful. Um, As I mentioned, you know, the dancers' dreams, they want to work with some well-noted choreographers that may at the moment be seen in the ballet world. Well, they're interested. Our dancers are capable. So why not start to, I don't want to say unblur the lines, but, you know, just come on over to Dallas Fly Dance. You know, we're here waiting for you. So it's those kinds of things uh, I'd like to, you know, push forward. And of course, you know, most dancers, their interest lies in performing and touring. So figuring figuring out the formula as it relates to um, presenters uh, presenting Black dance companies on their season. Sometimes they feel like mm-hmm. one Black dance company in their season is enough. Oh, that really uh, strikes a chord within me because how are our arts patrons going to get to know the breadth of what exists if they don't know about it? So I feel like we can't always do what's easy. Dallas Light Dance Theater doesn't always try to do what's easy. We use what works, and then we need to keep pushing our internal boundaries, which in then you know is a reflection on the outside. So I have high hopes, and with the dancers that we have who are willing to be vulnerable and open, generous, and genuine at all times, whether they're walking through the halls of our building, in the rehearsal studio, um, engaging with our audiences after a performance or what you see on stage. They're consistent and they care about each other. That's what makes us work because they're in it to win it. And you really feel that when you watch them perform too. You really feel it emanating from the stage. Yeah. Melissa, thank you so much for for taking the time today. Um, And I wanted to mention in the show notes, I was going to say we have links with more information about the spring celebration performances. I forgot to add to my list to call out. That's also streaming. There's a streaming option for those of us who can't make it to the theater in Dallas. You have been so great with your virtual programming. Um, So we'll have that information as well, for sure. Thank you. Fantastic. It's been an honor um, to chat with you. And um, I just thank you and the dance edit for all you do for the dance community. Thank you for keeping us together. Thank you. It's such a privilege. Another great big thank you to Melissa for that lovely conversation where, I don't know if you can tell this in the recording, but we both ended up getting a little weepy. As promised, in the show notes, we have all the info about DBDT's spring celebration and about how you can stream that program in case you can't make it to the theater. We've also linked to the company's touring schedule, which is very robust, so you should be able to see them either in a theater or on a screen near you sometime soon. And thanks to all of you, as always, for listening. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing.